Gentlemen, time to get started. Uh, our next speaker is Joe Gordon from Pinterest, who is here to talk to us about Python profiling and performance tuning. Everybody, please welcome Joe. Thanks. So today, as we said, we're talking about Python profiling and performance tuning. Or as I like to think about this, Python isn't that slow. Um, although this is about Python, a lot of the problems we faced here are applicable to many languages. Um, I know Go has the same problems, Node.js, JavaScript have the same problems, um, other Python frameworks have the same problems as well. So the problem we were facing at Pinterest in particular was things are really, really slow. Um, so this is an example. I was working at the time on the search subsystem. And so this is a, the API latency for the search system was two seconds just over. Um, and that's not including network. That's just on our side measuring on the varnish layer. Uh, and the, search actu the actual system that does the searching actually does all the heavy lifting was a very small percentage of that, 70% of it. So we had this question of what's going on, why does most of the time to search something on Pinterest actually not, is not spent in the search system? Uh, furthermore, why is that the bottom line here is the actual time it takes to, look, to do the search query, and the top here is the actual latency from the API endpoint. So why is the difference in the height over here much, much worse? <coughs> and we also saw the same pattern across all API endpoints, um, where we saw a fluctuation of the, the latency during the day and the nighttime to be about 50%. So during the day, it was twice as bad as at night. And so once again, why is it so much worse during the day? We're doing something really wrong here. So the latency doesn't make any sense, and we're just seeing these huge fluctuations, and nobody really knew what was going on. Um, so to really talk about this, this sort of gives away the first half of the talk. Uh, the problem is gEvent. But to really figure out what's going on with gEvent here, we have to talk a bit about it. Uh, who here has actually used gEvent or something like it? OK, not too many. Anybody use coroutines? Go, something like that. OK, so they're all the same basic model. Uh, gEvent is a coroutine-based Python library that uses greenlets, which are coroutines, um, and on top of a, a, a libEV event loop. And so this is really great. It has a lot of really great properties we'll talk about. Um, some things it includes is the fast event loop, so you could do things. It could quickly check for network traffic. Uh, and coroutines are much, much lighter than threads or sub separate processes. So this is literally the canonical example of why gEvent is awesome. Th same thing for event, uh, event lit or um, uh, Go routines in Go. Um, so here's the example. We're just doing a few uh, lookups by hostname, it's looking for Google example in Python. We want to get the IP addresses. So this is a mostly network-bound operation. So instead of doing these one at a time, you could actually say, let's do them all at once and parallelize the network uh, work. And then we could actually look up what's going on on the event loop, and we could see when the requests are done. So instead of doing these all one at a time, we could all do them uh, all together at the same time. So this is really great. You have a lot of network activity. API servers are often doing a lot of network activity, so this is a really good fit. So where this fits in our stack at Pinterest, this is a very overly simplified architecture at Pinterest. The smiley face is you. Um, our API server is uh, gEvent Python-based, and we have a bunch of different backends that are in a whole bunch of different languages, Python, Java, Java uh, Go, and a few others. But today we're going to talk about the API server. So we look at this API server. We actually have a separate different, we have Nginx as a reverse proxy, and we have a few different sub, separate Python processes that are running uh, gEvent in the form of greenlets. So we're actually using this all over our stack, and this is a really critical piece of our system. And so the fact that most of the latency is coming from the front end may mean something's going on over here. So to really figure out why gEvent was causing us a bunch of problems, it all comes down to cooperative multitasking. This is a, a common problem in a lot of um, uh, coroutine-based systems. Um, so coroutines, in this case, greenlets, all run in the same operating system thread and schedule cooperative cooperatively. This means until a particular greenlet gives up control, other greenlets won't get a chance to run. So that means as long as you're doing something CPU-bound, which you don't yield control in green, a gEvent, you're going to be blocking every other request. Um, gEvent's designed to you actually yield control where you're doing a network activity. So you say, I'm about to do a network activity. I don't need to wait and use the CPU. So other things get to run in the meantime. So this is great for a lot of network-bound systems. But what happens you mix I.O. and CPU-bound uh, network and CPU-bound applications? There's a warning here. This is not an issue for I.O.-bound applications. But be aware when doing something CPU-intensive. So why do they warn us about this? What actually happens? To answer that question, I set up a little IPython notebook. And so this is a little very, very small example of sort of to figure out what's going on. So we have two things. We have the client, which is also using gEvent, in this case in the form of the gRequest library. So this is actually, once again, a good example of why gEvent is really nice. We could actually do a bunch of concurrent requests to the server. And we can specify over here how many you want to do at a time. And over here, we specify how many you're doing in total. So this is actually a really good example of why gEvent is really useful. This is a purely uh, network-bound client. So this is a great thing. But on the, the server side, things aren't so great. So we have a, a yield operation, which is simulated here. 
and we have a blocking network, call, a blocking CPU call, which is simulated by uh, simple sleep, and we also have a network call, which is simulated by doing a G event version of sleep. And so overall, this should take 150 milliseconds, with 50 milliseconds blocking and 100 in non blocking. So, what happens if we do 100 requests one at a time? Well, everything works just as expected. We see 100 mil 150 millisecond latency in the mean. Um, and in fact, the max latency is about 160 milliseconds, which is also really good. And you can see the distribution here is nice and uniform and sort of what you expect. So that's great, but what happens if you do more than one thing at, at the same time? That's really what GEvent's all about. Things don't look as good anymore. So all of a sudden, the mean latency is 200 milliseconds, just about, uh, and the max is 371, which is much higher than our goal of 150. And so this graph down here really breaks down what's going on really clearly. We can see a lot of the requests are taking 150 milliseconds, a few are taking 200 milliseconds, which is 50 plus 150, and a whole bunch more are taking about 250, which is two extra blocking calls of 50 each. And as you would guess by now, the same pattern gets worse and worse if you do more and more requests at the same time. So at 10, the mean latency is 330 milliseconds, twice as bad as what we're trying to hit, and the max latency is half a second. And furthermore, at 15 requests, we hit the max is 10 times slower than what our goal is 150 milliseconds, and the average latency is 680 milliseconds. So something is getting really, really, really bad here. And we can see by mixing CPU and network requests, something's going really horribly wrong. So to really figure out why that's happening, we actually have to look at the log. So this is the log of doing five concurrent requests for a request, in this case, request 92 out of 100. So we can see here we're entering the G event yield. The yield isn't supposed to do anything. It's not supposed to take any time. But we see her actually entering a blocking call for request 91 over here. So that adds 50 milliseconds and shouldn't be there. Uh, we exit that. We enter our blocking call. As you can see, nothing's actually running because when you're blocking um, the, th uh, the process, everything's getting blocked behind it, so nothing else can run. Then we enter our networking call. The networking call should be 100 milliseconds so we can fit in two blocking calls from other requests. But instead, we have three there. So in the end, this request takes about 250 milliseconds instead of the 150. Um, and this is exactly what we were seeing before. So what does this actually mean for Pinterest and for coroutine-based pro co systems in general? Uh, performance, degrade, uh, performance degrades with increased CPU usage. If you have a single process and you're doing too much work and you have too much CPU usage, you're blocking everything else behind it, and you see uh, latency will spike. Uh, furthermore, performance also grades with more requests you do per process. So if you have an option of using more processes, that's even better. Um, and this is because the operating system has preemption in for processes, so you don't get this headline blocking pattern that we're seeing here. Uh, so the two things we could do about this is we could use more processes. We use several processes on the system. Before we were pinning it to the number of cores, we found out that we could actually just bump it up to, I think, 1.5, the number of cores, and magically everything got a lot, a lot better with, I think, a three-character change. Um, but we could do more than that, though. We actually now know one of the big problems we're seeing with our G-event-based system is that we're mixing a lot of CPU and a lot of network. Um, I think the problem with a lot of systems is you think your system is all network bound, but you even have a network based system, you have to do all kinds of serialization, deserialization, um, encoding, you know, gzipping or whatever it is, and you have a lot of business logic potentially, uh, and all this hidden complexity you're not realizing is using all your CPU. So because of this, we found out, we decided to set a goal to make things a little bit better. And this is based on the fact that our API cluster, which is G-event based, was a big source of latency as we saw here, and it was also, I think at the time, our top or second to biggest um, cluster by expense. So this is a really, really big expense for us, and it was causing, causing a lot of latency for users. So I thought I could tell two different people the same thing, or different things, make two promises and do one piece of work and get twice the credit. Um, so the goal was to increase throughput and decrease latency by decreasing CPU usage. I told people care about cost, I'm uh, decreasing, or increasing throughput, and people care about latency, I'm increasing la uh, decreasing latency, and we're able to do both in the end. So we set a goal which was make everything 33% more, uh, more efficient, and to really define that, to really hit that, we need a clear definition of what that actually meant. Uh, I couldn't just you know, write a few diffs and say, OK, everything's better because I say so. Uh, we wanted to actually be able to measure it clearly, so we picked a measurement that was sort of easy to measure over a long period of time. It wasn't complex to get. It wasn't expensive to, uh, to define. So we already track requests per second, per, and then we also track the number of hosts we have. So we just divide the two together and we had requests per second per host. And that was the goal. And the reason why that works for us is because we autoscale our cluster based on CPU usage. So if we decrease CPU usage, we could do more requests per second per host. Um, so that was a nice thing because of autoscaling. Um, we're all on Amazon for this. Um, it was an easy metric to define, and that fluctuates as the system gets more efficient or less efficient. So to really figure out what's going on, we need to figure out, to make things better, we need to figure out what's going on. And for that, we need to use profilers. Um, I think there's a big misconception in, in Python that it's, there's no good profilers out there. Um, and if you don't know where the profile, you don't know how to find 
What's expensive, you really can't optimize things. You can guess, but more often than not, your guess is wrong, at least that's my experience personally. So to solve this, there's a few different profilers you looked at, and this is sort of the order we addressed them in and we looked at them. Um, the first one is API C profiler middleware. There's a line profiler, and the lastly, statistical profile, profilers and flame graphs. So API profiler. Um, this is based on the WorkZig Work library. This is a simple uh, API middleware in Python. So you just say, insert this middleware into the system, and magically it starts collecting data on each request. What's really nice about this is you could profile each function uh, getting called. You could build graphs like this of what's actually happening. This is actually a call graph of when you go to Pinterest, for example. Uh, and you can save each request to a separate file. So you can actually see when you do that request, this is what gets called. Uh, the big problem with this is really large overhead. It's not a big enough overhead that you could actually that your request fails, but it's a large enough overhead you can't run it in production. So to do this, we actually had to run this in our development environments, um, which is unfortunate because it caused a few problems, as we'll talk about. So this is actually an example. You go to Pinterest.com. I think it's either going to the home page or going to search. This is actually what happens behind the scenes. If you can't read this, neither could I. I actually gave up on using a computer for this. I printed it in a large format printer we had and put it on that giant table and you know, leaned over it like a giant newspaper and tried to find things that way. But that didn't really work so well, but it looks really pretty. So we had to try some other approaches. So thankfully, the data we have is actually in a nice uh, parsable format. And there's actually a standard library in Python called pstats that lets you parse all this data and analyze it and do all the, these really interesting things with it. So there's all kinds of really cool features. You can import the, you could, um, you do Python, you specify the module stats, pstats, and you specify the file here. And you can do all, all kinds of interesting things. You can look at the data, you can look at the, you could sort the um, function calls by the amount of time spent in them, the amount of time spent in their children, et cetera, et cetera. You could sort by all kinds of things. So you could look at um, some really useful things, who called the function. So you could look at callers and callees. So here we see, convert experiment object to dict was called by get group, and the other way around, this convert object called get limited user experience, experiments. Um, so we could really see some really interesting things and we could dive through it. Once we have sort of a lead of what we want to look at, this is a really great way, great way of actually diving through the call graph and figuring out what's going on. But as we saw before, it's a big call graph, so sort of doing this by hand, it's a, you know, it's a wild goose chase in a way. Um, so thankfully, this is a standard Python module. You could do all kinds of really cool things with it. So I thought, I'm looking for things that are not doing a network call, so maybe I just look for all the children. I take a function, find all the children of that function, all its grandchildren, and I look if any of them use the network. In this case, if you look at the code carefully, I'd see if socket is anywhere in the children. Um, that works surprisingly well, actually. We found some really interesting things. So right off the bat here, we see there's a few things that sort of uh, we could ignore at the top, handle one response. Um, this is the C profile, we're getting called the WorkSig middleware we're using. Is based on C profile, C profile, a standard module. So this is something that's really strange. If you know anything about Pinterest, we're not a massive company yet, um, but yet it takes four milliseconds to see if somebody's an employee or not. We don't have that many employees. There's no way on earth that should take that long. And so right off the bat, we can see there's some really interesting things here. Um, and this is a, was a great way to sort of start out and find out, hey, what's taking all CPU, not doing any network uh, calls, without actually having to parse through the whole giant call graph no, by hand. So that's really great. Now we know this one function is really slow, but why is it slow? So just saying the function is slow isn't always that useful. You want to find out what's going on so you can make it better. So here's an example of part of that is employee case. So is employee test user. If you look at this long enough, you probably could guess where it's slow. But more often than not, you know, functions are much more complicated than this, and it's hard to guess what's going on. So to, to solve this, we use a line profiler, which, once again, is fairly easy to set up. You decorate the function, the slow function you're looking at with a at profile. Um, then you use, instead of using Python, you use something called kernprof. And I think the guy's last name who wrote this is kern, so it's a nice, sort of like Linux. Um, and you take a synthetic test you actually want to use to test the code. Once again, this is way too slow to run in production. Um, and so you need to find some synthetic tests. Usually I've been using unit tests, or I've been taking data from production and writing some sort of benchmark myself, micro benchmark. Um, you run the code on, under kernprof, and once you get the output data in this lprof file, you pass it into the line profiler module, and you get this output here. And now we, instead of looking at the function and guessing what's going on, we see really clearly that, oh, it's the regular expression match over here on line 88, and most surprisingly of all, line 92, l.blist, that's actually also really slow. So the regular expression uh, problem is really easy to fix. Um, if you don't think about Python, the problem here is we're actually compiling the regular expression every time. We can move it to the top and compile it then. Uh, what's really nice about this is even though if you look at this code, this is obvious that it's a problem, you know, our code base is thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of lines long. You don't want to search through the whole code base 
and sort of guess, oh, that's slow, that's not slow. Um, you can really easily see that's the slow one that's getting called often. And there's a few other uh, interesting lines here. So you can actually see in my test case, I call this function 200 times, and it looks like half the time it hits the if domain line over here. And that's where the 200 and 100 are here. And the line that's most useful uh, of all those is the percent time. So that's really good, but this is a synthetic benchmark. Um, what's interesting about this actually, that I was looking at when I was reviewing my slides, is that half the time it's a Pinterest user is going to the site, which I don't think is uh, necessarily true. So this may not be a great, uh, synthetic benchmarks aren't really always accurate. You really want to know what's going on in production. Just because I found this case to be slow, how often is it called in production? Sometimes you find really, really fast functions are called so many times that they actually make a big difference. Sometimes really slow functions are called once a day. They don't matter at all. So you have to be really careful what you're profiling and what you're optimizing. You don't want to sort of guess and say, that's a slow function. I can make it faster. It may not matter at all. So to do that, we have to talk about statistical profilers and flame graphs. So a bit of background about what the difference is between regular profilers and statistical profilers. Regular profilers are event-based profiling. That's the two we talked about before. Uh, they track every single event that's happening in the system, which is one of the reasons they're so slow. So they track, um, the first case, they track calls, returns, exceptions, and the line profiler, it tracks also every line being called. And because of that, um, when you actually enable these, they make things really, really slow. What's really nice, though, is they're very deterministic. You know exactly what's happening. You see every single line. Um, but if you want to run them in production, the, the overhead sort of kills you, and you can't really use them. So the other option is statistical profiles, which sample the data. Uh, the way they work is they probe the, the call stack periodically. They're, I think, almost always based on sending signals to the system, and there's a signal handler on each process who will wake up and collect the stack and record it. They're non-deterministic because we're just sort of looking, saying, hey, every five milliseconds or whatever it is, every millisecond, tell me what you're doing, tell me what you're doing, tell me what you're doing. So you could definitely miss things. Um, the way around that is you actually just run things for a bit longer. You say, for example, we run, um, we collect data for about 15 minutes in production, and that turns out to be enough data. We see a pretty consistent result every time. Um, the overhead is small enough. I haven't been able to measure it yet. Um, running with and without the profiler seems to make almost no difference on the load on the system, which is really great. Now we can actually run things in production, and users won't notice, and we get great data in return. And we'll talk about two, two examples here, the stack profiler, stack sampler, and VMProf. So the first one, this is the one we're currently using the most in production. The stack samplers come from an email company, of all things, called Nihilus. Um, and this is sort of the gist of the code here. It records a stack every five milliseconds and emits the data over localhost. So the code here is actually much simpler than I think I thought it was, at least when I first looked at it. Um, so we initialize the sampler here. We set up the interval to five milliseconds. We set up a dictionary to collect things. We go into start here. We set a single handler for SIGV alarm, and we collect when an alarm get, that alarm gets called, we call sample, and then we set a timer to actually call that alarm every in five milliseconds. So once we go into sample, what we see happens is we pass in uh, the frame here. We take the frame, we format it into a stack, and we collect it, and then we call another, um, set a, another alarm. So that's all it really does. Every five milliseconds, your process gets an alarm, it wakes up, it calls sample, it gets a sample, it writes it to memory, and then goes on. Um, and in this case, the format we're looking at here is stack and then the count. So we can actually see this is actual a sample stack from production. Uh, once again, you can see we use gevent here. So this means uh, run is getting called, which uh, calls notify links, which calls switch, which calls switch. And we saw that specific uh, frame 43 times. So this isn't so useful when you have one little thing, but when you build up a list of what's getting run over a long period of time, you have a really nice view into what's going on. Uh, the second profiler we've started using more recently is called VMProf. This came out of the Python PyPy community, um, in part because they're trying to optimize use cases for PyPy, and they found that um, these PyPy is jitted. There's all these subtle complexities about what's going on, so they needed a better profiler to figure out what was happening. What's really, really cool about this, actually, is that I think this is a fairly new feature, is you can do statistical line profiling. Not only could you say, tell me what function is getting run on the stack every so often, but you can actually say, tell me what line is getting called. Um, and once again, because it's a statistical profiler, it has a really low overhead. Um, and unlike the previous pr line profiler we used, you can actually profile the entire code base with minimal overhead. Um, it has a few rough edges. For example, we can't run it in production yet because I found some cases where it crashes after a few minutes. Um, but you can still run it in development environments for us. And there's a lot of cases where it works really well. So this is an example of the different kinds of output you can see from the system. So this is the more traditional function call um, data that you get from the other profiler as well. Where you can see here, all it tells us is this function called burn takes 100% of the time, and iterate inside of it takes 100%, and next ran takes 8%. But that doesn't really tell you what's happening the rest of the time. And the reason that's happening is because 
this uJSON line here is actually a C module. And we're actually not, we can't actually look into the C stack. All we can see is the Python stack of what's going on. So with the line profiling on, we could actually see that, oh, here, this line over here takes 17% of the time, next ran plus this operation over here. But the most of the time is actually spent in uJSON loads, uJSON dump. Um, so this is really nice because not only could you actually uh, build a flame graph with this data and actually look over the, the large view of which function takes the most time, but you already have all the lines for each function of what, you know, where the, you can look at each function one by one and see which lines are taking a long time. Um, so instead of having to find test cases and decorate the function and rerun it and, and do all these things, you get all this data from production really easily. Um, and to, to view this data, there's something called uh, flame graphs. Um, and these are a bit hard to read. The first thing about, about them you have to know, who here has seen a flame graph? Okay, so here knows the colors mean nothing. Okay, that's surprising. Um, the colors look really pretty. In the default case, they mean nothing. Um, people, I think, ask me a lot what they mean, and I say they look pretty, and they're always shocked. Um, but to read it, you have the percent time on the bottom. That's a bit confusing to see. That's not, this isn't time on the bottom over here. This is actually the width of the block over here represents how much time is seen in that function. And uh, the y-axis is the height of the call stack. So here we can actually see everything's run inside a G event over here, and we have this long tail for a whole bunch of different things. So this makes it really easy. Once you get this statistical data, we can actually look at overall, say, what's happening in 15 minutes, what's happening in our production system, where is the time being spent across all different systems. This isn't synth synthetic data. This is real production data, which is really nice, which means you don't, you don't have to guess, hey, what's going on in production? I can't profile it. It's too slow. All of a sudden, you have all the data right there. Um, so the way we actually collect this in production, it's really simple. We have a signal handler, a separate signal handler we, handler we set up. SIG user 2, in this case, we send a, a kill, we go kill SIG user 2. That enables the profiler. We turn it off after 15 minutes, and we save the data. Um, and that's all there is to it. And it's really simple to run. We can run it at any production machine, and we get really detailed data about it with no overhead. Um, one of the problems you face is that something changes in production. You want to know why. And you look at two flame graphs and see what changed between the two. Um, so one of the things we worked on is actually looking at, there's a few ways to do this. One of the ways we, the way we decided to do for, to diff two flame graphs is we want to look at both sides and look at what's only in A, what's only in B. This is commonly what happened last week or, you know, when things look good and what's happening now when things are, are better uh, or vice versa. Maybe something was added and something was removed and you want to see what changed so you could figure out if there was a regression of what happened. So one of the examples of this, you can actually see the output here. In this case, we see that 2.4% of the time is different and most of the time is identical. This is a placeholder. Um, the identical line over here, and you can zoom in. You can actually see this case, we had the change was something called filter bad queries. So all of a sudden, we can actually see in a big code base what small, small thing happened. Usually it's a single commit or some little piece of code that changed, and you can actually have really nice insight into what's changing instead of having to guess, look at git logs or, or things like that. Um, so we're putting this all together, a few examples we have. So the first thing I worked on was actually uh, was the home feed. That's the, the, feed, the view you see when you go to Pinterest.com. And something really interesting here, uh, it takes 30 milliseconds to do deep copies um, every time you go to the home feed. And so that, um, so this is interesting, but you want to know, hey, this is from, a, this is from my, my development environment. This actually may not be in production. Maybe this happens only for me because I'm an uh, employee. Who knows what it is? So you could actually, with the flame graph and the statistical profiler, you could actually say, hey, how much of production time is spent in deep copy? It turns out it was way too much. We're spending 10% of the time in production on deep copies. Um, and if you don't know why deep copy is called a deep copy, you can see it here pretty clearly. Uh, it's a nice big recursive thing. In Python, it copies the whole entire uh, a dictionary, let's say, and it copies all the, the nested dictionaries inside of that. So it iterates over the whole entire uh, thing you're copying, and it's very expensive. So now that we know not only is this happening, we found it in, in a development environment, you see that it's actually confirmed in production this is happening a lot. We can actually now work on fixing it. It turns out the fix was really simple. Um, we used deep copy and we didn't need to. Somebody just didn't realize the cost of deep copies. I think this is one of the big gotchas with Python is it's really easy to write code. It's not always easy to write performant code. Um, it turns out we just removed the deep copy and everything still worked. So we can look at afterwards and see what happened. This is our metric we've been tracking, which is request per second per host. And we see there's a giant spike in, in efficiency over there. We saw a big shoot up of the number of requests we could do per host per second. Um, and you could confirm afterwards that everything actually worked. So in this case, we see deep copies only 1.6% of production now. And we looked at those cases, and they were small enough, and I think they're actually necessary that we didn't want to spend a lot of time investing in there. It's not like a big 10% win that we had before. Um, another example we had is one day um, in our metrics we have where light blue is last week and dark blue is this week. We actually saw the latency shot up, and the efficiency went down. 
So what happens? Previously, this is an unanswerable question. We could just measure it and we could say, the developer wrote something we don't know. We'll have to look at you know, three days' worth of logs, and it'll take a week to figure out. Um, but with all the statistical data, it's really easy. So this is the answer right here. If you can read that, you have really good eyes. Um, it took me, I think, a few weeks to figure out where that was. Um, so this is where the differing two flame graphs comes in handy. We actually want to see, hey, what's new in each one and what's been changed. Um, and the answer is really quite simple once you have that. We see that 2.7% of the time is in this thing, delta E CIE 2000. Uh, we found the commit that added that function there. I said, the asked the developer, hey, what's going on? He goes, oh, whoops, sorry, and he turns it off. And so it's a really simple fix. Um, and going back to the original picture, this is where it was. So if you could read that, I don't know how you found it. Um, but having the diff there makes it much, much easier to figure out. These near impossible questions to answer are all of a sudden really simple to answer. So being able to prevent regressions has been really powerful for us. Uh, another problem we had is we use a library called Thrift, which is an RPC library. Who here has used something like Thrift, Protobufs? Uh, there's a few others. GRPC is another one. Um, they're very similar. So we found out they're spending 10% of our time, 13% of our time, uh, doing Thrift encoding and decoding. Um, and Thrift is a big part of what we do, as talking to backend systems are all use Thrift, but that seems really high. And we can see here what's actually happening. It looks like it's a whole bunch of work actually to do the read, you get the data back, and you have to turn it into Python. And it turns out that was taking 13% of the time. Uh, and it turns out this has actually been fixed a few years ago. There's a C accelerated version of Thrift. This is sort of another big lesson in Python. If something's really slow, you write it in C. Um, somebody wrote it in C years ago at this point, um, but there's a few bugs in the system, and we had to fix those. So there's two main bugs we had. The fixed version wasn't released, and that's in 0, 10, 0, which last I checked has not been released for two years now. Um, Unicode support was broken in, in the version that was uh, shipped in 0, 9, 3, the last stable branch. And there's a problem with subclassing um, the T-binary protocol factory. So the problem we had is we actually used, um, this is the original code here, which you're checking if the class equals that versus checking if the instance, which means any children of it. In our case, we actually had inheritance. We used a different name, a uh, different class, and it, so everything started failing. Uh, so we fixed a few lines of code, um, shipped out the change, and everything was magically better. We spent 2.2% of the time doing thrift work instead of 13. Um, and I think that change alone shaved 100 milliseconds off uh, latency and a huge impact on our efficiency. So it was just a few lines of code over here, in this case in C, but once we actually found out what it was, it was really easy. The hard part was actually identifying this in the first place. Um, so the impact of all this together, so this is where we were before. We were at um, about 2.2 seconds to do a search on Pinterest, which is super, super slow. 70% um, of the time, the latency was actually outside of the search system, and the latency was, the fluctuation of latency was mostly from the front end. And so afterwards, 50% of the latency is outside of the search system, and even more exciting, the height of the actual API latency is the same as the backend latency, which means the latency is all coming from the fluctuation in the backend system. We're not incurring any weird spikes of latency during the day. Um, so this had, a really big impact. This is on the search system, but overall the same, same technology and the same approaches we're using worked on all the different endpoints. Uh, so I made search faster, but I made everything else faster at the same time. Um, before the fluctuation was 50%, uh, now it's about 22%, and we increased the request per host uh, by 40%. So that means if user growth was stayed flat, we'd use 40% uh, of your machines to run everything. Um, and even more exciting, we're actually now able to detect regressions uh, detect and understand what's happening if there's a big regression. So one of the big problems we had is that we can make things better, but developers, rightfully so, are naive about the performance, performance implications because it's really hard to understand what's going on in production when you're looking at a development environment. Um, and so now we're able to detect that very quickly. You know, a day after deploy, we can see, hey, something went wrong, and we can really easily figure out what happened. Uh, so in conclusion, I think there's a few sort of lessons here that, um, I think the first lesson that I didn't actually write is Python isn't really that slow. Um, it can be very slow, but there's ways to optimize it uh, to make it much, much better. Uh, when you're looking at some sort of performance issue in Python or any other language, you want to understand your bottlenecks, really understand what's going on. Before we understood the G-event problem, people were sort of guessing in the dark of what was going on, and we had no real, no real clear understanding of why things were slow. Uh, in our case, we were CPU-bound, and we understood that, but there's other cases where there's network-bound, uh, you can be memory-bound, you've seen that as well. Um, and cooperative multitasking is a complex beast. And if you're using it, um, we've seen similar problems in uh, Node.js. Uh, Node.js is the same exact problem, so if you're doing one thing that takes a long time on Node.js, say rendering a whole page, it could block a whole bunch of things. You need to account for that accordingly. Um, profile in production, do it live, as they say. Um, synthetic benchmarks are never, ever enough. Um, they're good for you know, small tests, and once you know what something's bad, to make it better. Uh, but to start out, you always need production data. Um, 
Visibility is really important to this problem. You can't figure, you can't fix it if you can't see it. Um, profiling your code is really valuable, and defining an efficiency metric to figure out if things are getting better or worse, or to see if you're actually making an impact is really important. If you don't have that, you'll just sort of guess what's going on. Um, finding out what to fix is way, way harder than finding than actually fixing it. A lot of these fixes are really small things. But they took weeks or months to actually dig in and find out what was going on. Um, there is always low-hanging fruit, even if we think there isn't. Um, I've been working on this even more recently, and there's always more low-hanging fruit. Um, keep digging into the, the call graphs, and you'll figure out, and the, the, the data you have, and you'll find more things that are sort of obviously bad. Um, and also, lastly, watch out for performance regressions. They're going to happen if you have developers who are working on things. They're going to make innocent mistakes, and things are going to get worse. So you have to make sure just because you fix things doesn't mean you're making everything better. Things can be moving out from underneath you. And that's it. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Joe. We have time for a few questions, if anybody wishes to. Yep, there we go. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm interested uh, if you have done a whole bunch around profiling memory as well and then associating, say, very large spikes in memory to specific lines of code. I found that to be by far the impossible th or particularly hard thing to narrow down. Um, the short answer is yes, and I saw the same thing as you. Um, we tried that a bunch, or I tried that in a bunch and found it to be near impossible. The problem in Python is everything's a dictionary. So if you want to look and say, hey, what's the most common object in, in memory? It's a dictionary, and that's not very useful. Um, if you have a small, there's a bunch of memory profiles. If you have a single function and a small piece of code that you know is to be uh, memory intensive, you could figure that out. Um, but that's not really that useful in production uh, with really large, complex code base. Um, one thing that I did have a lot of success on, sort of, was one of the problems we saw is there's a lot of memory usage at startup time. So I think there's about 600 megabytes to load a single process and do nothing whatsoever. Um, so I actually instrumented the import module. Um, so I recorded the amount of memory before and after. And I was thinking, oh, maybe there's one big thing that takes up all the memory. It turns out it was death by a thousand cuts, and everything takes three megabytes or so. Um, that's still a really big challenge, I find, for profiling Python. And if you find an answer, let me know. Okay. Uh, I have a question and an answer. Uh, TC Malik has a heap profiler, which is quite good. Um, the question, the, early on in your presentation, you had some graphs about latency, and I was really interested in how you created those, because it looked like you had a pretty nifty tool. Yeah, so this graph? Or? I know, right back at the beginning, where there was ah. um, this? No, earlier, the ones with the this takes, yeah, those ones. Those yeah. ones. Um, I can send you the code as a short answer. It's an IPython notebook. Um, this is the most of the code here, but there is one of the standard Python libraries that just plots things out. It's actually the, the hard part of the code you, you don't see here is actually the, the logging here. Um, the way this actually works is we collect a bunch of stats. I think I just collect the amount of latency per request. Um, I have logs in a separate file. And then I take that data back over here. Um, and then I just format it and, and do a, a scatter, whatever plot that's called there. This is one of the biggest surprises for me, actually. I didn't expect the latency to be so bad when I started this out. I figured, oh, it'll be like a little bit. And uh, Have you tried uh, USDT tracing at all? To use what? USDT, eBPF uh, profiling? Um, yeah, we haven't tried that in part because we had such low-hanging fruit of what's going on. Um, there's a bunch of more higher. One of the problems we have is we're only sampling every five milliseconds, which in most worlds is a you know forever and a half on a computer. Um, but because we have such big, the problems we have are so high level that it didn't seem sort of a great solution for what we had. Um, we're still dealing with 30 millisecond pauses here and there, and five millisecond uh, granularity is enough for that. Um, in the future, I think I would like to get to the point where we actually have to measure much lower level things than what we're doing now, but we're not there yet. Any other questions? No? OK, then, in which case, thank you very much, Joe. And with the thanks of the organizing committee, a small token of appreciation. Everybody, once again, please thank her. <laughs>